up to read our scripture this morning. Um, it comes from Genesis 1, chapter, uh, verses 26 to 31. Good morning. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all of the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord.
grace that never gives up on us, never leaves us. Lord, when I mess up, you are quick to um, forgive and to, um, you know, bring me back into your kingdom and to, to guide me into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, I just pray for me and for all of us, God, that um, our love for you would grow deeper and deeper and stronger and that it would, it would cause us to want to live our lives in ways that bring a smile to your face, in ways that honor you. God, that we wouldn't be following a list of do's and don'ts, but that we would be following by listening to your Holy Spirit's guiding in our lives for the things that you want us to be a part of, the things you want us to run after, the places you want us to serve, the people you want us to love. And uh, God, that we would do it because we love you so much. And that's when your kingdom comes, God things that we do come from a place of love rather than a place of obligation. May people see in us that great love that you have for us that causes us uh, to be more like you. Um, Lord, we just ask today um, a special blessing on Iglesia Damasco as they um, have um, hard news coming their way, God. Today, their church finds out um, the same things we talked about last week. And so we pray um, that your grace and your mercy would pour out upon them. And that you would give them wisdom and discernment. And um, God, we pray for both of our church bodies that you would guide us in the ways that you want us to go. We pray that um, love would rule um, both churches. God, um, we thank you for the ministry that you've allowed us to be a part of in our community. And as we give our tithes and our offerings, God, we ask that you would use them to further your kingdom. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, hope you're enjoying your Memorial Day weekend. It's a long one. For some of us, it doesn't feel much different because it's been one long time at home. But we're glad you're here with us today. And uh, we don't have a lot of announcements because we're still not back in our full normal schedule yet. 
Um, so be watching for that. Probably come, you know, later on in June as we get farther into those phases. Um, our denomination has asked that we still not hold any children's, um, you know, things or open our nursery. Um, so if you need coloring pages or anything like that, we have those we can give to you um, for kids that are here today. Um, we have a special little video, Florence. Um, we show us a picture of Florence, Zach. Florence is our resident little duck. And look at, she has babies. It's been uh, exciting to watch Florence. It's like watching paint dry because she would never move. I mean, until <laughs> just, uh, when was it, Thursday or so? Yeah, Wednesday. She was really fidgety on her nest, and <clears throat> you could suspect something was going on under the surface. And, uh, yeah, so drove into the church parking lot on Thursday morning, and Florence is sitting here in the drive through which is very unusual. But... Um, Lo and behold, she had seven little ones with her. I thought Doug Hanneman was going to cry. <laughs> you know, there are just some levels of sweetness that penetrate everything, aren't there? Well, happy Memorial Day. It's a day when we need to uh, pause during the busyness and the, the chaos of, of uh, life as we know it now to uh, recognize and memorialize and uh, treasure the memories of those who have uh, died serving their country. Um, we can never underestimate the cost of life that uh, gives us the life that we're able to live. So in whatever form you do uh, your remembrance, um, just take a moment, continue to pray for extended families that are still wrestling with loved ones that have been lost over the the, uh, over the years. I don't know if anybody was able to catch it on Friday morning, but our own Rebecca, who usually sits right down here behind the Johnson clan, uh, she was on the Kevin Miller show on uh, Friday morning at 6.30. If you missed it, I understand. But uh, speaking of, about her work at the Boise Rescue Mission, uh, she's one of the directors of the women's program there at Boise Rescue Mission, and uh, so we just wanted to give her a little shout out and say we're thankful for everything that she does for our community, and uh, she's excited to be a part of our church, and that's uh, that's a good thing. We're excited to have her here and her family. And as Marcy mentioned, uh, be praying and be in prayer for Damasco today. This is uh, hard news, and you know, just like we did, and just like we talked last week, we had hopes and dreams as well, and uh, so let's um, let's recognize that as well and, and support them with our prayers. We're going to move on in our study of some of the greatest questions that Jesus ever asked, and as we note every single week, as Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven has come, the kingdom of heaven is here, the kingdom of heaven is emerging on planet earth and then he began to explain how it worked he didn't do it solely by giving, giving great answers he would often use parables to make it understandable but a lot of it was done by just simply asking great questions and today he does both he, he asks great questions around uh, a parable and the questions that Jesus asks, and I refer to this since I kind of stumbled into the concept, they're load-bearing. They hold things up. They hold things together. They give us a, a, a picture, a, a concept of what it means to be a person of the kingdom of heaven. They're more than just the weight of the words. They, they carry the essentials of the way that we should live and move and have our being in the world as citizens of another kingdom. Every question he asked challenged the status quo, the way things are, and challenged them toward life in a new reality, as, as God would have it. And this morning, we're going to look at a story that was brought to light through Luke's investigation. It comes in chapter 7 of Luke, and it's right after Jesus had finished a little bit of teaching. He'd been invited to have 
dinner or lunch or a meal in the home of a noted Pharisee. And in that day, the tables were very low, and, and Luke says, as they were reclining at the table. As they were reclining at the table, an uninvited guest entered the home. Luke 7, verse 37. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's home. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And a sinful life means exactly what you think it means. She was either a prostitute or an adulteress. And that in itself has to raise a lot of questions right there. Why is this woman, of all people, there? How'd she find out that Jesus was in town? I mean, the circle she travels in and the circle Jesus travels in, they, they don't entirely overlap, you would think. What kind of audacity would compel her to enter the home of a well-known Pharisee without an invitation? Didn't she know she'd be unwelcome? And, you know, what's with the perfume? So in one little sentence, it, it leads us to all kinds of questions as well. Now, scholars suggest that this woman, at some point she'd heard Jesus teaching, and in a moment, in a moment of repentance, her heart had been incredibly transformed. And so when she learned that Jesus was in town, she had to find him. She had to find him. Now, I was thinking this week, and I explained it, or I attempted to explain to Sharon and Marcy that sometimes when, when I find myself in a position of profound thankfulness, confusion kicks in. What do I do? What do I say? How do I express my praise to Jesus in this moment? And I have been so thankful that our grandson came through his surgery fine. And I haven't found that moment. I'm still in this little bit of dazed and confused state where I know I'm just about ready to explode in my praise and thanks to God, but I haven't found the words. I haven't found the moment. I haven't found the time, but I know it's coming. That's what I mean by confusion. We are so moved in the moment that our praise is... is Well, I hope you know what I'm trying to say. And this woman may have been in the same state, so thankful, so happy, so honest, so complete, so thorough. You know, oftentimes our, our praise comes out in just random forms. People get up from an altar shouting. A different person might get up just incredibly moved, but silent. Who knows how our praise is going to express itself? We don't always know. In one case, Jesus heals ten lepers. Nine don't even pause to thank him. I'm sure they were thankful, but only one returned to, to say so. And this woman who's, who's lived under the shame and ridicule of her unholy lifestyle, in a moment her life is transformed and she is free of that. She is forgiven. And she knows the source of her forgiveness. Verse 38 says, As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. We've been there when Thanksgiving just overcomes you. She couldn't care less about protocol. This is the only expression <clears throat> of thankfulness that makes sense to her in this moment. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And it's suggested in this story that the righteous 
invited guests are trying hard not to notice. Because if you notice, you're acknowledging her in your presence. It means that you'd let a sinful woman into the presence of all you holy folks. A sinful woman among holy people. You'd let a, a sinful woman crash this intimate, invited guests only dinner party. And now she's letting her hair down, which in itself is a, a, an incredibly intimate act. It's saved for the home, it's saved for the bedroom. It sends all the wrong messages. It's an intimate gesture. It's a stuff of social scandal, if people find out. Then she uses her hair to dry his feet. But what's even more scandalous is that Jesus doesn't seem to be minding at all. And now it's the Pharisee who's got questions. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were actually a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. She has a reputation. We know this woman. Simon and the Pharisee and, and all the invited guests, all the holy ones, are doing everything that they can not to see her, to not acknowledge her. And this woman... She's probably used to never being seen, but always being watched by holy people, by righteous people, by church people. She has probably always felt the sting of their judgment. She's probably used to never being seen, but always being watched. I love this. The Pharisee has just said to himself, and then it says, Jesus answered him. Jesus answers a question that is swimming in the mind of this Pharisee that he hasn't even expressed, but Jesus answers him anyway. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. So money lending is his business. He's a banker. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, a denarii was a day's wages. So one person owed him well over a year's wages, almost a year and a half's wages, while the other owed less than a couple of months. But neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, that, that there, that's an extraordinary thing. When is the last time the bank forgave you anything. Doesn't happen. They have every right to expect repayment. So he forgave the debts of both. They didn't even have to ask. The lender held the power. He could have had them arrested and they'd have to accept their punishment. But instead, he forgives the debt of each one. Then Jesus asked Simon, now, which of them will love him more? It's interesting, Jesus doesn't ask who loves him and who doesn't. Jesus assumes that both people who have been forgiven are going to love this person that has canceled the debt. But they don't love, they don't love equally. One of the two is going to recognize the extreme nature of their forgiveness. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned the toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman do you see her 
You see her? Do you see this person that you have been trying so hard not to see, not to acknowledge? Do you see her? Do you see her appreciation, her gratitude, her relief, and the fullness of her love compared to the love that you've shown me? Jesus says, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. You haven't treated me like a guest. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, the common greeting when you enter somebody's home. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head. Anointing guests was a a mark of hospitality. It was a mark of greeting, a token of honor in Greek and Roman and, and Hebrew cultures. But she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. She's not doing these things in a plea for forgiveness. These are acts of love in response to forgiveness. She is there doing these things because her heart has been transformed. She is forgiven. She is clean. The past is the past. She's not going there to beg for forgiveness. This is her thanks for forgiveness. She's been born again, forgiven, restored, redeemed, and just as pure in the eyes of God as a sanctimonious Pharisee. And look at how much more thankful she is. Do you see this woman? Who are you in the parable, Simon? The next thing Jesus says, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Now, Simon has likely been a rule follower his entire life. He's been diligent in his studies. He's climbed the ladder of his vocation. He's become a Pharisee of note. How do you do this? Well, you do this by rigidly keeping commandments, always making the right sacrifice on the right day, attending the right festivals, washing your hands in the prescribed fashion, holding the party line, If there was sin in his life, it's going to be minimal because he's lived an entire life of sin management. He met the standards met by the law. So what's left to be forgiven? Well, probably very little compared to a sinful woman. He didn't need a total makeover. She did. And it comes down to this. His heart needed breaking, and her heart needed mending. He needed to see her, and she needed to be seen. This is the mission and purpose of our church. Our hearts need to be broken, and their hearts need to be mended. We need to see them, and they need to be seen. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And this reassurance isn't for her sake. She already knows. Her life has already been transformed. Just a second ago, Jesus said to Simon, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. That's all past tense. It's already happened. Now, this was for Simon and his guests' sake. All those who have refused to see her. And all this does was create another scandal. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Some days you can't win. I mean, who has the audacity to speak for God? Who has the gall to step into the role of God and forgive this woman? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. 
go in peace. Shalom. Go. Go in the peace of God. The perfect peace of God. Shalom. Know that things are well between you and your heavenly father. What's Jesus saying to Simon when he, when he asked, do you see this woman? And what does it mean when, when Jesus asks this direct a question in front of a house full of guests who are probably just as self-righteous as the host? There are times and places and moments where in our righteousness, in our righteous stubbornness, we refuse to see. We don't want to see. Honestly, we don't go out looking for the homeless. We don't go out looking for the poor. And we turn away way too quickly when they stumble across our eyesight. Because seeing that is going to change you and seeing that is going to cost us something. We were talking in staff meeting about, about our need as, as human beings to be seen and understood. And I was listening on the radio about getting my absentee ballot and they made sure to tell me, now there's a barcode on the back of the envelope that's going to identify you. Don't you find that offensive when your life, your humanness is boiled down to a barcode? or a QR code, as if that is the story of you. But how many times do we look at people and we say, okay, well, that one there, they fit in this barcode area. We do this. Because if we truly see, it's going to cost us. It might mean that we're forced to step beyond stereotypes and preconceptions sometimes even bigotries. We may have to stop tagging people with the label sinner and begin seeing that person as him or her. We may have to begin to relate to them as one soul to another soul, each in need of forgiveness and redemption. We may have to relate to them with compassion instead of ridicule and judgment because in the city of Caldwell, there are both hearts that need breaking and hearts that need mending. That's why we're here. We have to find the broken hearts. I, if I haven't told you this week, I'll, I'm telling you now, you know how proud of you I am, right? I'm proud of you guys. And some of the proudest moments come during our community dinners when it's a, a pretty ragtag bunch of, of folks. And we have made, as a church body, as Christians, as people following Jesus, we have made some incredible strides in this area. We really have. Because strangers have become friends. We have asked them What's your story? We've taken an interest in each one of them. And you know, what we're finding is the more we integrate with hearts that need mending, the more attractional the gospel becomes. Now they want to serve with us. They want to bring the food. They want to help distribute the clothing. They want to help nurture the other. They want to start asking the questions of, how's it going? They feel included and embraced by a family like they've never known before. I thank each of you that participate in that. And I tell you that our next step forward has to include an even more deliberate attempt to see them as Jesus sees them. 
we need to understand that Jesus is anxious to forgive them. He wants to see that that man, that woman, that child, that family. He wants us to understand that each one of them is struggling against a debt. That Christ has paid. And it's a debt that they can't pay unless they meet a savior. Back to verse 42. Neither of them, both the righteous and the unrighteous, had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. We are so blessed because our forgiveness is initiated by the one that we've offended. In our tradition, we call it prevenient grace. The grace that is theirs to be grasped and there to be given as soon as we ask. The problem is, every debt has to be satisfied. And that includes, certainly, our sin debt. The debt we owe to the bank doesn't go away when we die, does it? Our children deal with it. Hallelujah. But the sin debt has to be satisfied. And we can satisfy it through the blood of Christ, or it's going to demand our lives. Jesus has paid it all. All to him we owe. The wages of sin are, is death. So let's be even more aware that our role is to see people clearly. Let's not see them as barcodes or QR codes. Let's see them and relate to them as one soul who has found forgiveness and redemption to another soul who has a heart that needs mending. Let's pray. Father, we are so aware. We are so aware of our need for grace. It astounds us. Not that we need grace, but that your grace is full and free and your mercy endures to all generations. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your goodness to us. We pray for our city. Father, it takes courage to uh, ask you to show us things that will break our hearts. And it takes courage because we know if we ask that, you're going to do that. There are certain things that we will see that we will never be able to shake, never be able to unsee. Yet, God, you have called us into that area of ministry and that's where we want to go. Help us not to label or judge or predict or assume. Help us to simply relate as one soul to another soul. Father, we thank you for this time together. Be with those of our own group this morning, Father, that are ill, that are not able to be here this morning. Father, for those that find themselves in the in quarantine uh, kind of situation. God, give them patience. Give them endurance. For those that are talking about going back to school fairly quickly, God, help them to uh, ramp up again and be ready with good cheer to welcome these students. God, continue to show yourself in this city and then direct and guide us and lead us into areas where you would have us go. For all these things, God, we stand in uh, amazement and we offer our profound thanks. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I give you my life. I give you my trust.
Boundless grace. 